In the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, a warm welcome to all as we gather to worship our God together this day. We're grateful to be able to gather here in the sanctuary and to be connected through our broadcast via live stream and on the radio. And to those new to Hope Church today, if you're a guest with us, we're so glad that you're here and trust that you will feel the welcome and hospitality of this community. I'm Hope Church Pastor Gordon Wiersma, and we're so grateful and honored to welcome Reverend Dr. Micah McCreary with us today, who is our preacher. Thank you for being here, Dr. McCreary. We're leading worship with our Director of Music and Organist, Rhonda Edgington, and we're grateful for all of those, the many people participating in worship today as the Spirit brings together the gifts present among us. As we worship together, we follow a liturgy, and there are bulletins available at the sanctuary entrances and online also. And in the sanctuary this morning, we're using the purple hymnal. Whether here or at home, we have prayers and responses, songs for you to participate in so that together we may join our hearts and voices in worship. So let us prepare our hearts to worship God together. Praise the Lord, praise God in the sanctuary of the Lord. Praise God for the mighty deeds God has done, for the surpassing greatness of the Lord. Praise God with the sound of trumpet, with lute and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance, with strings and pipes and clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is risen. Sound the trumpet of salvation. The risen Savior shines upon you. With thanks and praise, our hearts echo the joyful song of all God's people.
God's grace and peace be to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, seed of resurrection, you we bless, name above all names. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Jesus Christ, first fruit of heaven, from whom we come, with whom we stay, to whom we return. You we bless, name above all names. With all creation, we praise you, risen Lord, proclaiming you as the one in whom all things are being made new. How excellent your name in all the earth. Amen. Friends, the peace of the risen Christ be with you. Let us share a sign of that peace with one another. Peace to you, my friend. Amen. Join me here in the front of the sanctuary. Come on up. So good to see you today. Sun is shining. Tulips are blooming. So yeah, it's a good thing. So glad to see you today. I have to tell you something. There's a president here today. Did you know, did you know that? There is. Presidents are very important people. It's not the president of the United States, Joe Biden, he's, but it is a president. He's right over there. You see that? Look at that. <laughs> that is the Reverend Dr. Michael McCreary, and he is president of New Brunswick Theological Seminary. That's a school, a graduate school. It's for people who've already gone through grade school and middle school and high school and college, and then they're going to study some more because school is so great, right? So they keep going to that. 
and it's located out in New Jersey, started in 1784. Is that right, Dr. McCurry? Look, here's, can you see kind of these buildings, how they look pretty old there? Have anybody been to New Jersey? Has anybody been there? Yeah, I went there and studied there. There's another seminary down the road from New Brunswick, isn't there? I think Princeton <laughs> Seminary. There is. They're both, they're both good seminaries. Okay, all right. Well, uh, all right, we'll have the family work that one out. Um, and then there are these pictures more, let's look at these pictures too. This is more newer buildings. And then look at that library. Can you see that with all of those books? There's thousands of books that people study there. And I was thinking about you, of, 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 of meeting a president. Maybe you want to shake Dr. Mercury's hand afterwards. But what I have learned from Dr. McCreary, as I've come to know him as a colleague and a friend, of what it means for a president to be an important person. Because what I have found is that Dr. McCreary uses all of his responsibilities, all of the people that, that listen to him and that he directs, he does that so that anyone who wants to come to New Brunswick Seminary can come to study there. He uses his important position so that anyone who comes to New Brunswick Seminary feels welcome and included. He uses his important title and position so that anyone who comes there and is hurting and needs healing, that they can learn how they can have healing. And he uses his important title to say that God's love should be learned about and shown to the community and to the world. That's a pretty cool thing to learn about what being important means because Dr. McCreary knows what Jesus said, that those who are the greatest are those who use their lives to serve others. And so that's what a president looks like and that's what a president does. And that's what I have learned from him and you can learn in whatever you do, whether you're a president or not. I don't think I'm going to be a president anytime, but I can learn that I can use my life and use who I am the way that Dr. McCreary has taught us to, to welcome and include and love others as followers of Jesus. So I'm grateful for that today. And you'll learn the stories of Jesus as you go to the worship centers with Miss Jocelyn. Thank you for listening today. You got it, bud? The lesson from Acts chapter 3. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us, as through by our own power or piety we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified God's servant Jesus whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release Jesus. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what God had foretold through all the prophets, 
that God's Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from 1 John 3, 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Christ. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When Christ is revealed, we will be like Christ, for we will see Christ as he is. And all who have this hope in Christ purify themselves just as Christ is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that Christ was revealed to take away sins. And in Christ, there is no sin. No one who abides in Christ sins. No one who sins has either seen Christ or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. While they were talking about this Jesus, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do you doubt? Why does doubt arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when, you, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, there are many words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead, and on the third day, And that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
I, I am ready to preach, but I did just want to say hi. Uh, it is so good to be back. I began my presidency in 2017, the summer of 2017, and then we had the General Senate here in Holland in 2018, and I was able to preach here by invitation of your pastors. And since that time, in 2018, Hope Church has really felt like home to me. Hope Church feels like what the RCA could be, <laughs> should be. Um, as a member of the restructure team, I'm really careful with what I say. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's so good to be here, uh, so good to be here. I wanted to, as I looked at that gospel passage, the words came to me, sacred scars. And I remember back in 1985 when I was the director of a state convention, we had a youth retreat, 1,500 young people up on the mountain in Eagle Irie uh, Retreat Center in Lynchburg, Virginia. And we're praising God and worship is going and we're just having a good time. And I looked up and this young woman tapped me and said, I want to give a testimony. And I'm not a person who really follows structure. I'm, I'm really bad. So, you know, I, I, I was open to it. And as I looked at her, I noticed on one side of her face was without blemish, no acne, no nothing beautiful. But the left side of her face was filled with scars scars that she had received in a house fire. And she approached me and I wondered what she was going to do. And as that young lady approached the podium and took the podium, she began to say, you know, some of you all feel sorry for me because I have these scars. And you judge me and you think and you want to pity me because I have these scars. She said, but these scars are sacred. I'm like, where is she going with this? She said, in that fire, I lost my twin sister. In that fire, we lost everything we possessed. And all I got were scars and my life. She said, but that terrible moment in my life changed me. Before that, I took things lightly. I didn't really care. I was just out there. I was disrespectful. I didn't care about what to do with school. I didn't care about anything. She said, but since that time, every time I look at my scars, I recognize that I've been given a gift of life through the most difficult time of life. And that, that, that struck me as she said this, for a young person to be that insightful, first of all, was, was mind-boggling. But I, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm thinking, oh my goodness. You know, Paul says that in the King James, through all these things, with all these things, God is kind of working my good. But when I read the Revised Standard, it says, God is really working in all things with us to produce good. And I heard this young woman saying that God didn't cause the fire, but in that fire, with the consequences and the loss that she had experienced in that fire, God was working for her good with her. And I thought about the disciples as they walked in, and they were there in that room talking about the risen Christ, the, the sightings that had happened with Mary and the others and the possible sighting to Simon. And they were there talking and all of a sudden in walks Jesus. And I think like with that young girl, they were like, whoa, whoa, what is this? Um... Excuse me, sir, but you're supposed to be dead. <laughs> you're not really supposed to be here. And, 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 and being happy to see him on the one hand, but shocked, dismayed, blown away on the other. 
you know, as a psychologist, I'd say that, you know, it would have evoked flight, fight, or freeze. I mean, one of the three. I would have either run or took off or just stood there like, what is going on? It, 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 it's, it's there. And, and I think about that in our lives so often. There are things that happen when Jesus enters into these tough moments. You've just seen crucifixion. You've just seen beatings. You've just seen the, the, the whole rabbi, the teacher, the leader that you loved walking with you has been killed. All this is going on, and now he walks in the room, and you're going, what does this mean? And I think if we can just put it into the metaphor of sacred scars, it can help us. You know, these, these, these are scars. A scar is when the tissue has been injured. A scar is when the tissue has been hurt. A scar is when there's been internal injury. I mean, all these things have happened, and we often look at them as they're ugly, they're, 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 they're terrible, they need to be covered up. And what I see this text saying, what Christ is saying by saying, here are my wounds. Here are my scars that we need to take the things that we've gone through and allow the Holy Spirit to breathe on them so they become sacred. And how do we do that? The first is to actually verify the resurrection through the scar. The scar, if the scar is there and is healed, it indicates there's been resurrection. It says that this is something that has been fixed. This is something, you know, I, even as I wave my hand, I'm looking at these couple scars here. One is, is, is here and it's, it's like, I remember it because it's from a bow and arrow my brother shot at me, you know, and, and, and I'm so glad that it hit this tree stump before it hit my hand, you know, and so I can still move it. The other one is when we were actually having a pillow fight in the house house and we we're fighting and, and I jumped up high and I hit the, uh, the, the, the globe on the ceiling and it broke and it fell down and it hit me in the back of my hand. You know, there's scars there. They don't go away. But when I think about the fun that we had, <laughs> you know, it's different. When I think about how wonderful me and my brothers who we, we, sometimes we fought, it wasn't that pleasant, you know. So there's something about looking at the wounds for what God has done how God has brought you to closer together. We've gone through things as a church. We've gone through things as a family. We've gone through things as a community. And when we look at those things, rather than looking at them as hideous and terrible, look at them as opportunities that God is taking to mold us and make us and bring us better. Make us better. Move us to better. The, the second thing we can do with these things that make them sacred I love that Jesus said, okay, you all think I'm a ghost. Can I have some grub? I mean, can I have some food? Um, can, can, can we eat? Can we share? Can we break bread? You know, for, for me, that, that reminds me, of course, of the, the Lord's Supper where we have to break bread. I, 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 love, I love communion because I really believe that Christ is there. You know, I really believe that the Spirit is present. I believe that transformation is possible as we break bread together. There's something that always happens. On the Emmaus Road, it was when they broke bread together that they saw who he was. When we sit together as the community of Christ breaking bread together, I just believe the universal Christ shows up. I believe the Christ that is upset that we are dividing our churches over our beliefs about gender, over our beliefs about race, over our beliefs about class is upset about that. I believe the Christ is upset that Catholic and Protestants have divided. I believe the Christ is upset every time we continue to divide the Christ's church because the Christ says you are one. You are one in the Spirit. You are one in the Lord, but we keep dividing. But whenever we sit down and have a good meal, <laughs> it just seems like the problems go away. You know, folk don't even like each other, but if the meal is cooked well, you know, if it's a, you know, I I, I tell um, I see my, my 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 sister Kathy out there, but I have this um, bronzini. That's plural or bronzino for those who don't know. 
that I cook. You know, I, I, I have my, my, my pans that I have to put in the oven for 15 minutes to get them very, very hot, you know. Then I put, I, I have already basted it in a Thai ginger sauce with all of the different things on it. And then I, you know, I cook it for seven minutes on each side for about 24 minutes and then I serve it. I've never had a complaint. You know, folk, folk who don't even like me are looking forward to, can we get some of that bronzini? You know, it, it, you know, something just happens when we really do it right. And what Christ was saying in a sense, yes, you're scarred, but this is a way if you just share together, if you just break bread together, that you all can be connected. Then it really blows me away. I, I love to preach, and sometimes I do it well, sometimes it's all right. You know, but I realized that even more than preaching, Jesus said, teach what the word says about me. When he actually began to break open what the word said about him, it just illuminated its discipleship. We keep wondering, how do we rebuild the church? You know, it's by just really Walk, you know, and, and, and the best way to really open up the word of God and show people Jesus is to become the word of God and show people Jesus. Okay, catch this, catch this, it's, 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 a, it's a Christian trick that we've been doing. You know, you, you just, you, you go, you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then you start walking in the Spirit of God, and you walk like Christ walks. When you do that, folk have no choice but to see Jesus. And when they see Jesus, you know, when they open, he said, when he opened up Moses, when he opened up the prophets, I don't know about you all, but when you really say the word, that thing can get very confusing and become overbearing, overbearing and overwhelming. But when you see it in someone, mm, when you see it in someone, when you see someone that you love walking, when I saw that young girl talking that talk 40 years ago, you know, that she had been changed by a death, by pain, by trauma. When you see it walking like that, it does something different. There's a statement that Maya Angelou has said that's there um, at the Lynch Museum in Montgomery. I, I can't wait to get there to see it. But her poem says simply, it, 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 simply history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Let me read that one more time. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. You know, we always think that we've got to make the same mistakes again, but if we really embrace it, if those scars become sacred, we don't have to make the same mistakes our ancestors, our predecessors, and others that we love dearly have made. We make so many mistakes. People keep wondering why I'm so positive when I've, I've seen mistakes, but you keep seeing them. I'm like, why, why should I get upset that somebody doesn't like me because of the color of my skin? or because of my gender, or because of where I come from on East Michigan and not West Michigan, you know, you know because I'm a Wolverine and not a Spartan, you know. <laughs> it's because we've learned that no matter where you come from, there's stuff there. And if you can just see the stuff as things that can make you and help you be better, you can be better. You know, I, I was telling Pastor that I am, I am so excited for the restructure team to be over. <laughs> but it's not because of the work of the restructuring team. A couple months ago, the Lord blessed me to talk to a publisher. And I, I, I was telling the publisher that I've got a brother who, because of a foolish adolescent mistake at 17, wound up incarcerated. He was convicted for murder and was put in jail from 10 to life because he was so smart that he didn't stay in jail after 10 years. He escaped and got out. 
uh, when they caught him the second time, they were like, you're never going to get out. And my wife and I spent near a fortune um, with lawyers to finally get him released. So he was released in 2018 right after I left here. And one reason why this place is so special. And I was telling him I wanted to really publish my brother's memoirs. I wanted to really get into what did it mean to be incarcerated for f over 40 years. So while the older brother, I mean 17 months older than my brother, was, was out going to college and, and getting degrees, my brother was getting his degrees from inside of the prison system. And I wanted to write that. And the, the publisher said, well, we're not interested in memoirs. I said, okay. But another publisher looked and said, but what we are interested in, if you could write an academic piece looking at reentry, we're interested in that. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write an academic piece looking at reentry, I've never been entry, let alone reentry. Um, so there's one expert that I know who has done reentry. Because see, what happened, I, I, I'm going to tell you the story, don't be done. My brother came home, right? I'm over in Amsterdam, uh, you know, the other Holland, you know. I, I'm, I'm over there and, and, and having a wonderful time. And he, he, he FaceTimed me. He's like, oh, my gosh, I didn't mean to do this. I'm like, dude, it's okay. I haven't seen your face in 20 years. It's, it's okay. Use the technology. And we're looking there. And, and I called my younger brother. I said, you know, he's, he's, about, he's out now. He's like, yeah, I just went to pick him up. I'm like, what? You picked him up? Okay, what's going on? My younger brother decided he would take off for three months and help my brother get acclimated to being outside of the prison walls. Well, I'm like, dude, how are you paying your bills? You, you know, I, I know you said, well, I, you know, I'm just going to, I'm okay. My wife and I will pay your bills while you take care of your brother. And, you know, and, and we just did it. And it was just the most beautiful re-entry. And so Stephen has started writing, I didn't want to say his name, my brother has started writing, you know, what it's like to have re-entered, and I'm going to use that as the narrative to carry the book. You know, and God has said, in other words, the scars are now sacred. The pain, I'll never forget, I'll never forget walking with my mother right the first time we visited him in prison. And she had to go through my proud, proud mother as they searched her, as they, you know, checked her out, the bars. I remember her jumping as they closed the bars behind us. And now she's living with him. They're living together, making life together. That scar has now been sanctified because it was prophesied when my brother was young when he was born he was very sick and it was prophesied that my brother would cause my parents the most pain but would ultimately bring them the most joy and when I saw him released and I saw my mother's face I saw that prophecy come true and that scar was made sacred God bless Let us respond to God's word in faith as we rise together in body or in spirit to confess our faith using these words of scripture. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand and by which we are saved, as we hold firmly to the message that was proclaimed to us, that Jesus was sent to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the Lord's favor. We confess that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, 
and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter and to the Twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Be seated. As I highlight a few events in the life of the Hope Church community, I want to again extend a special welcome for those new to Hope Church. And I invite you to learn more about Hope Church through our website and also at the welcome desk in the gathering area. And you're always welcome to leave contact information for us as well. Following worship, there is a time of fellowship in the gathering area, and all are welcome for some conversation and refreshment together. And today is a special fellowship time as we'll be celebrating the completion of our kitchen renovation that was uh, completed last fall. So after we have some refreshments, uh, there will be a brief program expressing uh, thanks to the many people who were involved in this project. And you'll be able to uh, take tours of the kitchen space and see that uh, wonderfully renewed, uh, renovated space. In the gathering area, you'll see that there is a sign-up for the Spring Diners Club that's being held on Saturday, April 27. There's announcements in the bulletin on page 14 and 18 and a link, an online link too to sign up. We are asking that folks could indicate uh, today their plans to participate that and hope that uh, we'll be able to have some groups for that Spring Diners Club. With our ongoing restoration, uh, our or ongoing organ restoration project, you'll have heard today some uh, organ music in our sanctuary and wanted to again thank Trevor Dodd as a friend of Hope Church who has provided the temporary organ that Rhonda Edgington is using. And they worked out some technological details with Ken Chamberlain and Dan Fisher. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. The electric sound goes through a computer program and then the computer program through the speakers. Um, so we're grateful for the creative technical minds that worked that, uh, figured that out. I think we'll probably enjoy that sound and also be really glad when the organ restoration is done. It's a good combination, right? So we'll keep you uh, posted as uh, next steps unfold with that project. It is a blessing, Dr. McCreary, to have you uh, with us uh, leading worship today. And where's Kathy Proctor, your colleague? There's Kathy. Thank you so much for Kathy being here from New Brunswick Seminary. Um, we're so blessed for our, our friendship of uh, mutual uh, support and blessing uh, with New Brunswick Seminary for their role in our denomination and the leaders that they train. Um, Dr. McCurry mentioned his uh, recent book that was published, uh, Trauma and Race, A Pathway to Well-Being, and uh, he has brought uh, copies of that book along. That was so nice that you did that, Dr. McCreary. And those are available in the gathering area, and you can get a signature uh, today with a very nice pen that I provided for Dr. McCreary. So there we go. He forgot his pen. So. <laughs> As we turn to a time of prayer, uh, please note that the, the memorial services that will take place this week, um, service for Susan Rhodes on Thursday morning and for Terry Pott on Friday afternoon. We continue to pray for the Spirit's comfort and peace for the Rhodes Winchester families and the Pott family. You'll also notice that the flowers in the sanctuary today are in loving memory of um, Ed Anderson from his wife, Ann Anderson. So as Elder Peter Bogart leads us, let us be called to prayer. God has made the one who was rejected the cornerstone of a new community. In the name of Christ Jesus, let us pray for the needs of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, 
as the risen Christ opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures and gave them power through the Holy Spirit to walk boldly in this world. Open your people today to the healing, wisdom, and faith given in your word. Lord, in your mercy. Prince of Peace, as Christ Jesus showed his wounded hands and feet to the terrified apostles, reveal to your church and to people of prayer in every faith the wounds of our neighbors, the fears of individuals and families, and the avenues toward healing. Lord, in your mercy. Author of life, we beg for peace among nations, peace through communities, peace within families. Guide leaders and voters, legislators and parliaments, judges and juries. Teach diplomacy and let our ways be formed so that all creatures, plants, and people may have plenty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Light in our darkness, let your brightness burn in places shrouded in violence. Reveal the pains that are hidden in secret. Unveil the needs of our own hearts so that we may know the power of vulnerability. Your son was raised to life even from the grave. Show us again that life comes from death. Lord, in your mercy. Healer of our every ill, we pray for all who are in need, for refugees of war and all who are displaced by storms, for rescue workers and medical teams, for those whose bones are weary, for those who show us the power of community to give hope to the frightened, and for all who have asked for our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, we commend and us to bring to you our deepest desires. O oh God, and we pray now for those persons and concerns that lie on our hearts, spoken aloud or in silence. For Leon, Jeff and Jerry, Betty and Cecil, Jackie, Shirley, Barbara, Bruce, Claire, Tom, Allie, Abe, Doug, Matt, June, Drew, Steve, and Pam. Lord, in your mercy, trusting in our abund in your abundant mercy, O God. We commend into your care all for whom we pray in our own lives. And we offer the prayer which Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As the deacons set the offering plates near each exit, let us consider how, how God might be asking us to offer ourselves and our gifts.
God of great gifts, this morning we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you thanks. With resurrection humming in our hearts, our minds are tuned to your song of peace. We joyfully present these gifts to you, a tangible chorus of thanksgiving, a harmony of hope for your kingdom come. Amen. I pray that the 
Lord will bless you and keep you. That the Lord will make the Lord's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. I pray that you would accept the resurrection so much so that you would become witnesses, not just in Holland, but all over the world. And I promise you, you've already done that because every place I go, I testify of the greatness that God is doing here in Hope Church. God bless you. God keep you until we meet again. Amen. Amen.